Welcome to this uh, session on rural development and innovative practices to improve accessibility in rural areas in low-income countries. After the presentations uh, this morning, which were very high-tech and certainly very high-income country-oriented, we're now going to look at another reality. And this is the reality facing many persons with disabilities in many developing uh, countries. And we have a excellent uh, panel. Uh, I was gonna say a well-balanced uh, uh, panel, but uh, we have lost two panelists, uh, one from Zimbabwe, and uh, now uh, with the absence of uh, Deepak from Nepal, uh, not so balanced. Nevertheless, uh, let us uh, begin. My name is Bob Ransom, and I am the co-founder with Laureate Yetnabush, and we will have the pleasure of hearing from Laureate Yetnabush tomorrow, co-founder uh, and first executive director and now senior advisor for the Ethiopian Center for Disability and Development, ECDD. ECDD is a local, non-governmental organization in Ethiopia uh, promoting uh, inclusive, uh, disability inclusive uh, development. Uh, at the time ECDD was uh, established, the founders noted that there was a gap, a divide between those organizations providing services to persons with disabilities and mainstream development organizations that were not including persons with disabilities in their ongoing health, education, livelihood, and community development activities. So ECDD was created to bridge that uh, gap. Uh, today, ECDD uh, has uh, 40 staff members working in six regions of Ethiopia. Uh, and in uh, four priority areas, inclusive health, inclusive education, inclusive livelihoods, and inclusive uh, development. Ethiopia is a very large country, over 100 million persons, and uh, is predominantly a rural society. And despite uh, the uh, rapid rural to urban migration taking place, the reality for most persons with disabilities is still one of rural uh, deprivation and rural inaccessibility, uh, uh, lack of access to basic uh, services. So today we're going to explore some innovative practices to address the needs of persons with disabilities and families uh, in, in uh, rural uh, uh, economies and uh, rural environments. Just a word about how ECDD is addressing the needs. We are undertaking a, <clears throat> a strategy of multi-party, multi-sectorial, multi-donor uh, program in one region of the country together with the government to address the needs of children, youth, and adults with disabilities for health, education, livelihoods, and participation in community development. <clears throat> We're doing this through disability awareness and inclusion training for government workers, health extension workers, uh, agricultural agents, social workers, and for personnel of faith-based organizations and uh, other uh, community organizations who have field-level projects in the area of health, education, and livelihoods uh, development. This program is uh, funded jointly by uh, Light for the World and by uh, Irish Aid e uh, Ethiopia. It's a major program, <coughs> excuse me, 
that will uh, be um, uh, a multi-year uh, program uh, to develop a, a new strategy uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the government. What I propose, since we, uh, there are only three of us on this uh, panel, is that we um, go ahead and uh, ha hear from the, the other panelists. Oh, good, Mr. Deepak is now here. Um, and then uh, we hopefully will have time for uh, questions and uh, answers. So you can please note any uh, questions you might have, uh, and at the end uh, we'll uh, have time. So now I would like to uh, ask um, Lasanti Daskan uh, from Sri Lanka to introduce herself, her organization, and uh, the uh, innovative practices they are undertaking uh, to address uh, the removal of barriers and to promote accessibility in uh, rural uh, areas. Over to you. Thank you, Rob. Um, uh, so I'm Lasanthi. I'm a lawyer by profession. I'm actually here today not to present about the work that I have personally done, but to t speak about um, a project done by my late husband, Sinarata Tanayaka, uh, for which an award is also being um, given this year. Uh, so I think, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this, uh, so as you, uh, to introduce a little bit about Sri Lanka, we are a small island just below um, India, I mean, below the Indian subcontinent in the Indian Ocean. We are, well, we elevated to the level of a middle income economy a few years ago, but our rural realities are still very harsh. Most of the, we have in most of our rural areas, people, uh, depend on farming as a livelihood. Um, and accessibility, when you talk about accessibility, living alone, people with disabilities, people with that, without disabilities themselves uh, find it challenging in terms of accessing schools, accessing transport, and livelihoods, and uh, various other issues. So my husband, my late husband, Senarath, was a politician who was a member of the provincial council in a rural province called Uva, and he represented one of the most rural districts in uh, Sri Lanka called Munaragala. Uh, how do I go with this? The green, the green one, okay, sorry. Uh, so he represented Monuragala, which is the second largest and one of the poorest districts in the island of Sri Lanka. Uh, the majority of the people in Monuragala live in rural areas. Farming is, uh, like I said, the main livelihood. And approximately, we are very, very bad with our disability statistics, so we we assume there should be about 8 to 10% of people with disabilities. And um, about 9.2 of the people older than 60 years of age. And generally, like I said, accessibility in Monaragala is very poor. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of one of the main city areas of Monaragala. And as you can see, um, you don't see any accessibility. Uh, so this disabled and age-friendly city concept was developed by Senarath in 2011, and he presented that at the DPI World Congress in Durban in 2011. And when after he presented it and came back to Sri Lanka and started talking to people about this, uh, the World Health Organization in Colombo approached him and said, look here, we see a lot of similarities between uh, what you're talking about and the age-friendly cities concept of WHO. So because of that, the uh, first phase of this Monoragula project which was done in a division called Valavaya, joined the Global Age Friendly Cities Network in 2012. And uh, we have, uh, and then the project has gained recognition because of that. But then one of the things that we noticed very prominently was that Monaragala was very rural. 
whereas the age-friendly cities concept focused mostly on urban areas. So we saw a lot of gaps in these two concepts. But then the interface between aging and disability was very clear, and access was the need for access was universal. So what the concept uh, encom encompasses is an inclusive district where barriers for people with disabilities and older persons are completely eliminated. The concept encompasses improvements to the built environment coupled with social and economic inclusion. Uh, the interface, like I said, is between aging and disability is considered and heavy emphasis on the necessity for multi-stakeholder participation because this was implemented through the UA Provincial Council, a government uh, a governing body, it is very important to get the participation of all stakeholders, including people with disabilities, disabled people's organizations, and in, 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 in a country like ours, donor agencies, and private sector, education sector, so there was the need for huge stakeholder involvement. Um, so again, a picture to, to just to show what the access reality is in a district like Munaragala. So this is a temporary access um, uh, bridge in one, of the, uh, in, the, in one of the villages, where beyond this point where you see uh, where the two ladies are walking are a few houses, and this is the only access for anyone to get into those houses in this particular village in Munaragala. And so, with all those barriers and all the hurdles that have been there, Monoragal has made, uh, I would say, <laughs> considerable achievements. Uh, the Pro Provincial Council established a unit for planning and coordination of the project, an accessible built environment in the main areas. Most of the public buildings in Monaragal have access now, which if you come to Sri Lanka and see the accessibility levels in Sri Lanka, is would, you would realize is a huge achievement because even in Colombo, the main, the capital, you don't see access as one of the priorities. So religious places of worship was given priority because in Sri Lanka we, play, we place a huge emphasis on religion and when people are older, there is a huge tendency for people to visit religious places of worship, engage in religious activities, and that becomes, for most older people, their main uh, uh, social interaction. And um, community centers, healthcare centers, though those are the main public places, and then access to education had heavy emphasis. Access to the electoral process, because Senrath was a person living with a disability, he always wanted to make sure people with disabilities has ac had access to the entire electoral process, not only to voting, but also to be contested and be represented. And like I said, love, livelihood support, self-employment, and also public sector employment under uh, a circular a government, circular healthcare services and awareness and training. So those were the main components that were um, uh, focused in, in the Munaragala project. So this is one of the access, um, one of the schools where accessibility was established. Uh, this young boy you see was already studying in the school. He did not have a wheelchair, but once the ramp access was built uh, and a wheelchair was given, he was able to access his school and he started coming to school every day. Uh, so when you, uh, to explain this a little bit more, so this is about this school. Uh, one of the main things that the project focuses on to start with, because the resources were limited, the finances were limited, they first, in, when it came to schools, they first selected schools where children with disabilities were already studying. And then they started establishing ramps in those schools. So as you can see, this young boy, uh, I think my time is going off, so I will just quickly say that um, after this ramps were built and this boy was given a wheelchair, two more children with disabilities enrolled in this school and also a teacher with a disability also joined this school. So this is a picture of the school where an accessible toilet facility is also established. 
So in Sri Lanka, after, I mean, with my late ha husband's uh, death last August, we seen some of the barriers, and then you see that personal commitment is not there, political will is not enough, but yet the Presidential Secretariat of Sri Lanka has taken up the education component, and they're trying to implement it in all the districts, in 24 schools all across the island, and DPOs and community-based organizations continue to ad advocate for access and inclusion, and the public officials, uh, sensitization of public officials have benefited. Uh, and challenges are we are under-resourced, so allocation of funds is low, lack of political commitment is one of the biggest challenges. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lasanti. Now I'd like to ask Deepak Raj Sopkota, to tell us about his work. On this right? Yes, the job. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Deepak Sapkota from Karuna Foundation Nepal, and I'm talking about a project, a model that we have developed, namely in Spartakia. About the organization, Corona Foundation was established in 2007 as an international NGO with the specific objectives of prevention of childhood disability. That means how a child can be born without disability and how developing disabilities could be prevented in the later stage. And community-based rehabilitation, how a child and an adult with disabilities and their family can have decent life within their own community setting. And thirdly, we wanted to strengthen the existing systems, local systems in place, in, so that they can take it over once we exit from the pro project area. Now we are working as a national NGO since 2016. In terms of essence of Inspire to Care, people with disabilities and their families are in lead position. So everything that we do, it's for the people with disabilities and their families. I would like to put emphasis on families because a person with disability, a child with disability cannot have you know, lots of opportunities and space in the community without strong support of the families. So family, the role, roles of families are very strong here. The local governments are taking ownership, as my colleague from Sri Lanka said. You know, it's challenging political commitment, but it's growing. There is functioning mechanism in place, as we have put a lot of efforts to strengthen the system in, in local communities, the mechanism they are in place, and the health services are accessible and affordable. Basically, the pri we are talking about primary health care services. In, in terms of innovative aspect, we see sustainability of a project in three different dimensions. One is financial sustainability. Yes, we need money to run a project, but that's not only the solution. There has to be a strong uh, structural or management sustainability. The, the most of the developing countries are suffering because there are no strong management system in place. So we need to have good management system along with good managers to make it happen. And then finally, quality. You know, if we compare the quality of Europe and, and, and Nepal, we cannot compare. But we also know that quality comes later because there has to be uh, services available, affordable, accessible, and then we can talk about quality. The other point is data. In terms of disability movement, one of the biggest challenges we do not have accurate data. And disability is very you know, challenging because in, it, has, it has so many different groups. So d data, severity, and then uh, all these kind of issues are pretty, pretty challenging. And then in terms of our project, we have developed a very strong database with all these kind of information. And we do have individual profile of every children and adults with disabilities who are in the part of the program. More than that, we have trained one skilled community-based rehabilitation facilitator with some basic health knowledge to provide support 
to the persons with disabilities, including therapy, but also to lobby with political leaders of that particular village and make sure that like these municipalities are taking care of those issues. And from the day first, we ask local governments to share the cost. We do not go to a village with a you know, basket of money and say, hey, we are here for a project. Let's start something. We want very meaningful participation from the local governments. And one of the precondition is they commit to share the cost from the day first and include the program in their annual and multi-year plan. And then technologies are emerging pretty powerful, very useful to function effectively. In terms of impact, very few, few examples I could, I'm, I'm going to share with you. The antenatal checkup visits, before it was 49.8%, now it has gone up to 83%. So maternal child health issue is, is, is properly dealt. Institutional delivery is, is still a huge issue in Nepal. It has increased. Immunization has increased. And postnatal care visits from 51 to 89%. Prevalence of disability reduced by 62.5%. This is pretty strong message. And I would like to challenge and provoke you know, colleagues and friends working in disability sector to come up with an with a, with a idea because we can prevent disability. And most importantly, 80% program villages are running the program even after the exit of Karuna. I think now I would like to play a one minute video to show you how things can be done differently. Parinai Janma Dine Maya Gurne Raychan Amanai Ama Mero Saas Mootu Ko Thadkan Ama Ko Maya Le Nai Chal Cha Jindagi Urkai Palai Tana Ram Lakcha Malai Mero Yes to troll no Udo Dabha Ama Le Jasu Ta Subhai Bhinu Lanu Nchya Oba Edi Mera Ama Nai No Bhai Ko Bhai Kole Saad Nchya Ma Ama hun Bhagavan, Ama hun Devi, Ama bina chal dayna mero jindagi, Ama bina chal dayna mero jindagi. Thank you. So success factors, we think one of the success for us was we, we, we link it to the political leaders from the very beginning. Without, it's a political issue. Development and disability is a political issue. We strongly believe on that, and we link it with, with the political system. Owned and adopted by the system, as I previously said, we do have data and relevant information in place. People with disabilities and families are being identified, recognized, and most importantly, accepted and there are a couple of social protection mechanisms in Nepal, and we are trying to link them as strongly as possible so that entitlement ca can be guaranteed. This is a child called Supriya Limbu, 12 years old, with cerebral palsy. You can see with a very small, a very minor kind of intervention, you can think, change things a lot. We have done little modification of our house to make it accessible. The wheelchair can go to toilet and to her bedroom and to, to, the, to the dining hall. She easily can growing pretty, pretty strongly going at school, and she says, wheels are my wings. In terms of financial issues and sustainability, I already shared with you that like, you know, we strongly you know, believe to sharing the cost. So for the first year, community says, shares 20%. In the second year, 50%. And in the third year, 70%. And then corona decreases by the same ratio, and from year fourth, they take it by independently. And it's shared financial, structural, and quality sustainability are the major feature of this program. Yes, I presented quite a rosy picture. Yes, it was uh, you know, not that difficult to achieve many things. But again, the challenge is you know, data. How to get disaggregated data of every individual who, who are scattered in the remote villages of Nepal? their types, whereabouts, severity. In a country like Nepal, geography is a huge challenge. We have big mountains, 
the mindset, still people consider it a little differently. Systemic commitment, political politicians are making a political slogans but not taking real responsibility when it comes to their travel. And we do not have facilities and services together with uh, technical human resources. The next step, we have made it pretty you know, successful in the first phase and we are now would like to go to the, the broader part of Nepal to cover more than 150,000 people with disabilities and uh, family members. Thank you very, very much for your, for your time. Thank you, Deepak. Now I'd like to turn to Stelio Ramos, who will tell us about his work in uh, Mozambique. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, okay. Thank you. My name is Stelio Ramos. I'm from Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique is a sub-Saharan country and uh, has uh, have uh, 24 million people. And uh, in terms of number of persons with disability, it's around uh, 50,000 persons with disability in the country. So Mozambique ratified the UN Convention, UN, UNCRPD in 2010. So since that time, uh, well, the government didn't have a lot to do on this area. Most of the activities is developed by the NGO with the collaboration of the government. So uh, one of the action developed was Light for the World together with uh, Young Africa, Training center, vocational training center in Mozambique, uh, tried to uh, to design a proposal to submit to European Union to have support to, to start a vocational training in Mozambique, because there is a lack of, of opportunity of employment for persons with ability in Mozambique. So, with this initiative, we saw. Uh, a door to open opportunity for persons with disability. So this project uh, started in 2015 and will end next year, 2019. So the idea of this project is uh, train 250 youth with disability. And uh, beside that, uh, to make a, a quality Training is necessary to make uh, the key objective of the project is to improve the uh, accessibility. We are saying uh, architectural accessibility and uh, also the social accessibility. Uh, also, we saw that uh, there is a big gap between collaboration of uh, DPOs in Mozambique with a different kind of service. We are saying health, uh, education, and we saw that uh, not only bringing youth with disability from the community for the training center will be necessary. It will be necessary also to make a link, a permanent linkage with uh, between DPOs and the vocational training center. Uh, so uh, in the future, it can be possible to include more person with disability even when the project ends. Um, had a, had a topic, a key objective of the project is to create a, a linkage between uh, labor market and the training because we, we know that uh, it's not uh, only the training uh, necessary to, to do that. It's necessary also to include a package of advocacy in the labor market to make labor market more inclusive and accessible for persons with disability. Uh, uh, we can see two pictures, uh, one uh, showing the first one with uh, ramps, uh, shows that uh, the training center was adapted to receive uh, youth with uh, disability, mainly person with using wheelchair. And uh, another picture show a youth called the Juan that uh, is receiving training on electri electric installation course. He has uh, uh, de uh, 
hear impairment. Oh, sorry, I'm trying. Is frozen? Yes. The innovation aspect of the project. Uh, first of all, the, this project uh, uh, is the first initiative in Mozambique country because in Mozambique we don't have the vocational and the educational training center is not accessible for persons with disabilities. So this is the the new one in Mozambique, and uh, also uh, it's an, uh, a role model for another training center to take it, it as an initiative for them. In terms of uh, uh, impact of the project, uh, was trained around more than 182 youth with disability. Uh, another is, uh, the, there is, as you can see in the PowerPoint, we have a low level of employment. This is because Mozambique is face, uh, facing a financial crisis since 2016, where more than 2,000 companies uh, closed their doors. And uh, actually, there is uh, no, no space to include people, even without disability, in the labor market. And so imagine for a person with disability that uh, there is a a stigma to in, uh, include them, and also this financial crisis. In terms of uh, internship, some companies are opening to receive a person with disability, and uh, we have uh, for around 47 companies that provide internship for the youth. And uh, also to ensure that uh, in the training centers uh, uh, should have uh, accessible for, for person with uh, deaf person, people, uh, we provide training on sign language, and we have already sensitized more than 60 companies with uh, two big events. One was a, a skill fair of person with disability, and another is, uh, was a celebration of 10 years of Young Africa Training Center in Mozambique. And uh, the event was focused on, on doing a debate uh, round the tables on inclusion of person disability in the labor market. Uh, okay. uh, we have two photos in the next uh, presentation. The, the first one is the, the organization of the fair. The, there was a lot of uh, institution, private sector involved to, to make a, a, a advocacy to employ more persons with disability in the labor market. And uh, the second picture show a youth training Young Africa doing interview with a local journalist. And uh, another picture, the third, is the uh, family picture of the event. And the weekends uh, for, and the, there is a, a background, yellow background. That's one campaign that we developed, Employment for All where uh, the idea is to employ persons with disability and uh, we, all, we, will organize, we are organizing big event, not only the big event, uh, round table, television, uh, debates, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, and uh, another side, we have a, a picture of a local newspaper talking about uh, disability inclusion in the labor market. Uh, in terms of uh, financial sustainability, uh, we have support from the European Union with the 1.5 million, uh, Austria Development Cooperation with the 85,000 85, euros, and the Light for World itself with 10,000 euros. In terms of uh, sustainability, uh, the idea is to replicate to the government the institute to replicate this model. Uh, not only this, and uh, Actually, we are, we are satisfied because the Young Africa Training Center, when designed uh, another proposal, always uh, ask our support to, uh, to do inclusive, uh, a, 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 a propose, inclusive proposal. Uh, they always ask for, for, for our support. And they also, uh, oh. 
Okay, so the, there is also the cooperation with the disability organization. Uh, we, have, we have already started with the community-based rehabilitation. They are sending persons with disability to the training. Even when the project finish, we will include more. Challenge of the project, sorry. Uh, we have uh, uh, three challenges regarding this, uh, this, this project. There's an education challenge. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stelio. <laughs> so we have heard uh, uh, from uh, our presenters, from uh, their experiences in three uh, different uh, countries, uh, to remove uh, barriers to accessibility in education, in health service delivery, and now in uh, vocational skills uh, training. Um, what struck me is that uh, all three um, of the presentations emphasize the multi-stakeholder, multi-party uh, collaboration, government and communities and uh, DPOs, and also uh, uh, attempted to address the impact uh, of their uh, efforts. Now I'd like to open this uh, up to uh, you, uh, the participants in this uh, session. Uh, if you have any uh, questions uh, to any of the panelists, uh, uh, please uh, raise your hand. Um, or uh, any uh, contributions to the topic of uh, accessibility in rural environments in low-income countries. Is there anybody out there? I'm having trouble. <laughs> I'm having trouble seeing people and hands. <laughs> yes, there's. Uh... Yes, sir. Sure. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Dr. Birendra Raz Pokril from Nepal. Uh, I would like to contribute uh, as uh, the presentation of Nepal. Uh, it is a wonderful presentation, and it is a very important aspect that how the Nepalese people with disability are facing challenges as uh, least developed countries. So there are some initiatives. Uh, they are being uh, uh, achieved by the endeavor of uh, different organizations. At the same time, we don't have uh, the government's uh, exact strategy how disability has to be taken from the development initiatives. As uh, the sustainable development targets, disability indicators has not been fulfilled and there is no common platform of the local government to address disability uh, within the development for framework. The things are still being taken from the charitable perspectives. So many things has to be done from the government level and the political aspiration and the political commitments are still gap. But uh, I would like to extend my appreciation for the presenter, Mr. Deepak, and the endeavor made by Karuna Foundation in the village level, how the community people are being aware about disability rights and how the children are being benefited by these initiatives. Uh, I just wanted to contribute for this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes, in the front here. Thank you. Um, Steffi Nance, also working for Luck for the World as EU Advocacy Coordinator. And I, my, my question links a bit to what the, the other gentleman has said, because you all talked about sustainability and how the projects are, or, or how it's taken over also by governments or by villages, villages and, and, and 
Um, I was wondering what you think are the key, um, I would say it's key criteria necessary to make sure that that happens. So that if you, as, as you mentioned, Corona, or if, if you leave, how, how is it taken over? And the same, how, how do you link up with the governments or how do you make them really appreciate what you're doing and take this forward? Thank you. Uh, let me take a few more questions and then we'll, uh, we'll reply. I saw a hand uh, in the back. We, yes, uh, please use the microphone. Hello. Um, my question actually is relating um, to the question from the colleague of Light for the World. Um, my name is Simone, I'm from Diakonie, Austria, and um, I was really interested in the issue that you get local governments actually to finance um, part of your project and to overtake more and more percentage, um, because this is something where we really face difficulties. And you were talking about local mechanisms in Nepal that you brought into place in the communities. I was wondering what kind of mechanisms you were talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Any other observations or questions? Yes. So my question is regarding um, in, in, uh, to the gentleman from Corona Foundation in Nepal. Um, so I was wondering about the model of helping um, the, the example of the child who was um, the, the houses that accommodations were made for, simple accommodations. So first of all, how do you locate um, the, the children or the people in need for the changes, how do you intend to make it as a sustainable project and who funds, um, like what is the methodology for funding sh such changes? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, Deepak to respond since many of the questions were uh, concerning the uh, Nepal. Yeah. Thank you very, very much for, for the concerns. We are really delighted to share with you all that from the day first, you know, one of the condition of uh, Corona to, to collaborate in a village is like a business. Whenever we go to a village, we sit together with political leaders and other key stakeholders and say this is our frame. We want to prevent childhood disability and improve the quality of life of persons with disabilities and their families in this village. Do you want it? If you want it, how? What are in your minds when we talk about these issues. You know, in the very first meeting, the political leaders looks very promising. But second time, when we sit together, they are a little lost because they have no in-depth knowledge on those kind of issues, as they are the issues not very much raised by media, by public sector, by you know, many other, other, other agencies. So they realize the importance. I think make convincing people to work on disability and prevention of disability in case in, in the experience of corona is not that challenging because this is pretty visible. You can see the difficulties and sufferings the people are having in their own village. There is a willingness to come out of this situation, but there are either lack of visions or lack of means and lack, lack of expertise. So corona exactly you know, try to hit those parts and work together with them. So once there is a political consensus made, we ask municipality council to sit together and, and to, to discuss. And then once they endorse the idea, that includes, as I said, two preconditions. One, cost sharing. You know, they may have less money, they, have, they may have more money, it doesn't matter. They have to show willingness of sharing the cost, whatever they do have there in their own basket. This is number one precondition. Number two precondition is we very much want that it is included in their annual plan and multi-years plan, so that ownership and then longer term perspective can be established. If you ask about corona, we have been able to reach to more than 5,000 children and adults with disabilities in one entire district of Nepal. And in all 10 municipalities of that district, are contributing more than 15,000 US dollar a year 
for a very comprehensive program. But do not consider that these programs only are aimed to people with disabilities and pregnant mothers. It improves the health environment of the, of the whole, whole village. So we, we try to create more synergy by putting efforts on bringing people with disabilities in center and pregnant mothers in center is prevention of disability is one of our uh, major role. The, 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 the path, you know, the, we have still to walk long way, but in one district we have make, made it possible. We are so encouraged and ambitious now to move further. We have decided to take 25 more districts of Nepal to pilot. And from the very beginning, if you want to know the cost sharing, 60%, let's say, tentatively is invested by Karuna, 40% by the villages in the very first stage. And that reduced significantly by the end of second year, and by the end of third year, they take it over. And the cost per village in average is about 4,000 US dollar per year once Karuna exit. And that amount of money can be raised, mobilized in each villages of Nepal, so far I feel. What we need in you know, constant lobbying and pursuing the issue to, to the policymakers, to the leaders, but also we need to create examples. And we are very optimistic that it can happen. Thank you very much, uh, Deepak. Uh, this session is coming to a close, but before doing so, I'd ask, uh, like to ask our artist just to say a little bit about uh, what she has uh, prepared uh, during this uh, session. Ah, there you are. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Yes, just quickly. Um, exciting and important important information uh, from rural development in low-income countries where we heard a lot of obstacles that you face because it's like the, the level you start from is like a lot of things you need to do. So for instance in Sri Lanka we heard about a project that concentrates on disability and age-friendly environments and just one thing I picked out was that for instance um, access to for instance the Religious practices is an important factor. So just one example of what you need to consider in rural development. An important factor that you also, Bob, you summarized it, was the involvement of various stakeholders. Stakeholders must be part of the whole thing, otherwise it doesn't work. So for instance, the health sector, the education sector, public sector, but also the people with disabilities themselves. Uh, in Nepal, we heard about many success factors, yeah? uh, making the link to the political system, just to mention one of them. But you also said that the families with children with disabilities are in the lead. So that is a very important factor in the Nepalese project. Um, how do you measure impact? You, heard, you told us that it's very difficult to collect data. So measurement of the impact is necessary, important and vital, but also very difficult. Um, in Mozambique, it's about um, vocational skills training, and you said 184 uh, or 82 youth with disabilities you've been teaching in your trainings. And um, you also said that the NGOs are the powerful ones, the ones who do things like Light for the World. Yes. Um, and you cannot relate so much to the government. Uh, we are related with the you government. We are related, but the NGOs are like the strong ones. Stronger, That's the yes. the message that I heard. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> and again, involvement of stakeholders, making the connection to the politics and the labor market, not to forget. So that the labor market also is involved because you want to decrease unemployment as, of course, one of the benefits of the whole thing. That's it very shortly. The picture can be viewed over there and have fun with the rest of the conference. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And may I ask you all to give a round of applause to our panelists. And thank you for attending the session. The session is now closed. Thank you.